Hey, what's up, everybody? This is JH. And I am BB. And this is the Chop It Up Show, episode three. What's going on? Podcast where we talk shop about life and business. Yes, sir. B, how you doing, man? Man, third time's the charm, brother. Third time is the charm. And I'm super excited. We got our Harlem Capital gear in, hey, finally. Hey, what up, what up? Uh, a lot of people have been asking us about the gear. Yep. Maybe we'll be selling some merch like we're Drake or Kanye. You know, you know what I'm saying? saying? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Um, but it's been uh, it's been an eventful week. Yes. Um, I want to know what's new in your life. Has anything mm. dramatically changed that we should talk about before we jump in? Uh, one thing that's really cool: we're working on our first um, brand deal together. Yes, that's true. Shooting some some content that's coming out uh, this week. By the time this video comes out, it'll be out. So that's really cool. Yep. Uh, and it's Memorial Day weekend. I'm speaking at the BYOB retreat. Oh, dope! Which is called uh, Build Your Own Brand. Shout out to uh, a brand, Brand and Andrews. Yeah, is that his name? Uh, brand with Drew. Brand with Drew. Brand with Drew. Andrew Wynn, uh amazing guy out of. Uh, he went to Hampton, I believe. Okay. Started an agency in Atlanta. Uh, he was also in Gary V's book, Crushed It. Oh, okay. He had cool. a few pages in there for his company and. Um, he's got about a thousand people coming into this uh, this this new first time retreat in DC, so I'm pretty pumped. Awesome! Shout out to that brother. Um, <clears throat> I have seen him promote his event steadily over time, mm-hmm. and, and you know it's just great to see it come to fruition. Yeah, um, and he's done a g- great job getting good people. Going back to what you said about our first brand deal, yes, um, maybe this is a good uh, subject to kind of jump in on and start with. Mm-hmm. I love. I think one of my favorite things to do with someone is make money with yes. that person you you really learn about somebody when you guys when there's money involved yep absolutely you learn about um you know their you learn about someone's temperament mm-hmm. you learn about their values mm-hmm. um you learn about their styles their approach to business yep. um uh, but for me it's a beautiful thing when you can find something you can find some way to combine your talents together right and break bread and mm-hmm. make money um, so anyway, I'm pleased to be doing that with you. Yep. Um, but let's let's jump into that a little bit. I mean, breaking bread with someone that is. Yes. Um, I think Drake. So Drake talks about it all the time. Mm-hmm. He's like he's like yo. I, I feel like everyone around Drake is breaking bread together with mm. him, and that is what has enabled his team to stay together for as long as they have. Mm-hmm. OVO. Yeah, I mean, you got to feed your people, right? Mm-hmm. You have to feed your people. You have to, if you're the leader, you have to be the visionary. And then you have to put people in, in the position where they can be successful. Right. So you got to set them up and do the right thing. Yeah, and I think when I started, um, I used to count on people to work for free. Mm-hmm. And that was a big lesson that I learned that mm-hmm. free work al- almost never works out because free work gets put on the back burner yep. first. And you know they, everyone has to eat, so you can't expect someone's free work to be prior, you know, priority yeah. prioritized. And then on top of that, it's not done with the same level of tender love and care. Mm-hmm. And then lastly, if it's not done correctly, I can't chop your head off and say, "Yo, what the fuck?" Yeah, you know, because it's free. Yeah, and then that even leads to uh, a- another way I can think about it is like. If you are doing free work for somebody and you can exceed those expectations and you can mentally put yourself in the position of as if you are getting paid, yeah, then you can really surprise somebody mm. and that can like trigger something that they may need to pay you or that's how you also get case studies, mm. right? Because like if you're building your own brand or if you're a company, you need a case study mm. to show to a potential person for sales. That's something that you talk about a lot, mm-hmm. case studies. Yes. Break that down for me. What is a case study for like, let's lay down elementary and then elementary. second. So let's start with that. What is a case study ah. in, in your mind? In my mind, a case study is when you are going full throttle on some type of client deliverable. Okay. Case study for me, for example, is I reach out to a brand. We go back and forth. I receive product from the brand and I shoot it as if I was being paid to pay my bills. Right. Right. And so what happens is I go into that strategy and that planning session with the pure idea to have an outcome, to have a full, whatever, two or three slides to explain exactly the type of value that I brought to the client. Right. So impressions, type of um, type of content, and then even just like strategy and vision. What did I bring to the client? And then you have the results. Right. You put that into two or three slides, 
And then now that's your case study to share with all the other competitor brands. So I if see. you worked with the automobile brand, right. you would send that to all their competitors afterwards. Even right. if you weren't paid, it's totally fine. Use it as a case study purpose. And do your best not to do too many case studies. Right. Because then you'll get into the, the um, I guess, the stride of doing stuff for free. Right. You don't want people to think that you're just free hire. Right. So that is a, is a really interesting kernel mm-hmm. of value, I think, um, because so folks have asked me a lot around how it was that I've been able to build my speaking career. Yes. I'm sure you get the question a lot as well around social media. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of it does have to do with that case study. Yeah. For instance. Well, I would say, um, yeah, explain a case study for speaking for us. For speaking, um, I'm going to go really tactical on this nugget mm-hmm. uh, because I feel like the, the folks who have been watching and have been sticking around for all 25 minutes of this podcast mm-hmm. are really kind of yearning for tactical stuff. Yep. Tangible so, takeaways. In the speaking field, your number one asset other than your perspective and you know what it is that you speak on, your mm-hmm. number one asset to secure other gigs is going to be your speaking reel. Yep. And your speaking reel is really just a collection of videos of you having done different talks yeah. right and so there's no better way to come up with a sizzle reel mm-hmm. than to go and do a number of different stages yep. and every time you do a stage um, guys if you are not recording every time you speak you are wasting the opportunity mm-hmm. or better yet you're just you're leaving a lot of value on the table yeah a lot and you're literally just documenting you're mic'd up and you're doing what you do regardless regardless so you might as well record it and then if you've done five to ten of these Mm -hmm. then you can have a video editor slice it down into a two minute video where it gives you know the client a, 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 a sense of what it is that you talk about and this is a perfect example riffing off what you said earlier Mm -hmm. how you can turn some free work into eventually you got to convert to paid yeah so once you have this the sizzle reel put together you use that as your tool for why you should be paid to speak yeah and I'll, i want to jump in right there i'm actually working on my speaker reel right now cool. um some of the if if you guys wanted to have some some insight on some of the uh, i guess the shot list that i'm thinking about um potentially having some folks who do testimonials for you mm. that's always good um having b-roll of crowds uh um, one of my mentors has said, you'll never speak in front of a crowd that's bigger than your, um, that's on your reel. So if you mm. have 500 people on your reel, it'll be hard for you to get to 1,500, 2,000 right. without right. some other magical, or like having an audience, having an audience for me has helped me quite a bit. And then having right. a, a lot of B-roll of you talking to people and sharing gems and then having you on stage. Those are like some core, like shot list type things that you can have. Um, and then going back to the case study situation, I wanted to just say this. You can also, even though you're getting paid all the time, you can create a case study whenever you work with a client in a new industry. Mm. So I just wanted to make sure I got that out there because say if you only work with fashion clients and then now you're working with a fragrance and then you start working with home and decor, you should create um, case studies for home and decor and for all the other industries that you get into because they're all very different. Just mm-hmm. like speaking, I can't get into speaking because I don't have a speaker's reel. Even though I have a large following, even though I have worked with a ton of brands, right? still need a case study for every different industry that you jump into. Mm. So it, it's, almost like, it's almost like you need, you would benefit from creating a case study for each, indiv- for each individual area that you want to mm-hmm. grow in. Yes, and obviously don't create a ton of different areas, but like pinpoint if you really, like for me, I did really well in fashion and then I got into lifestyle, which means like home and decor, automobiles, food, what have you. So that was a little easier to transition into. And then documenting, like we said, helps me with a speaker reel. I want to switch gears um, because this is inspiring me to to explore the idea of earning potential mm. right yes. so right now our you and i's earning potential is getting up there yes we're Talk, working on it bef- so lay the groundwork for a little bit and share a little bit about how you grew up what type of household did you grow up in firstly like, wow 
And, oh, okay. And, I, I see where you're going here. Okay. Uh, so for me, I grew up in a single mother household okay. who was not necessarily there all the time. Mm. So I grew up just from learning from what other folks did mm. and usually learning from what they did wrong. And so I just made sure not to do that. Right. Um, where did you grow up? Cleveland, Ohio. Mm. So Cleveland, Ohio, went to school at Ohio State, O-H-I-O, <laughs> go Bucks. Uh, but to that knowledge, like I got, I had a positive chip on my shoulder when I was growing up. Mm. And I wanted to continually just do better than others who had resources and wasted them. Mm. When I went to Catholic school or I went to Ohio State, there were so many people who were on scholarship or so many people whose parents paid for their tuition who were just not taking um, advantage of all the resources. And so for me, I took that as a positive chip. Mm. And that helped my earning potential. And then eventually I call it career capital. Uh, It's in a book that I read by Cal Newport building up interests and building up skill sets where they're eventually undeniable. My skill set was talking, charisma, personality, and things like that. Yeah. And then I leveraged it into business. Right. How about yours? So um, I grew up with siblings in kind of an immigrant household Mm -hmm. um, in, you know, uptown New York. And um, my parents, sounds like we have some similarity in that our parents didn't have a whole lot of earning power and they worked they worked, uh, you know, regular jobs, mm-hmm. and they traded time for money. Yes. And growing up, I always thought that the best way to earn money mm. was to work a job. True. And that the better job you got, the you know, the more money you would make naturally. Mm-hmm. But it was always tied to a job. Income was mm-hmm. always tied to a job. And it wasn't until I became an entrepreneur where I was able to break out that of mentality. That, yeah. Out of that whole paradigm i'm Mm -hmm. outside of that altogether now Mm -hmm. and i deal with um a very interesting dilemma right now where now that my earning power is increasing Mm -hmm. you know in some cases i feel i shouldn't feel guilty but sometimes i do feel guilty because what i can make in one talk or one social media post it might take my mom or dad two or three months a to me. full-time yeah. work doing actual like <clears throat> physical work you know waking up really early my parents are up at 4 30 in the morning every day wow. literally and you know they're not home until six or seven and yet you know i live a more comfortable life and i'm in this dilemma where i'm doing well enough to take care of myself and help my parents a little bit but not enough to um give them the life that i really want them to have so i'm in mm-hmm. this in between where you know it's just kind of interesting and i think about that like okay so what is it about Mm. what we've learned in the past few years that has allowed us to flex that earning muscle what does it come down to really wow man i mean it comes down to adding value right it comes down to like in whatever respective industry how much value are you adding that other comparable to other folks and so for us, for example, there aren't enough folks of color who are young, who create content that resonates with mm. communities. Mm. And people don't have big enough audiences. And so we're turning the, as a platform from TV and radio and what have you, changes to social. Now we have, uh, or just the industry has democratized everything with mm. social media. And so now we have the opportunity to really talk directly to our fans and engage and get deeper. But I'm going to push back on that because there's mm-hmm. a lot of people that are engaging directly with their fans mm-hmm. and they haven't been able to really flex an earning muscle and turn that into mm. like an actual career. Like we do what we love to do full time. Yes. B, that's a blessing. It is. That's a blessing. Mm-hmm. And I've been spending a lot of time this past week really trying to figure out mm. why that is. Um, and if I can... Yeah, dive into a little bit of what you were saying. I, I feel like when you can bring something truly different to the table, mm-hmm. that is when you're able to extract yep. dollars from it. For instance, I hmm, hmm. We'll we'll jump cut here. Um so as my career goes on, mm-hmm. I mean, we're able to charge more and more for what mm-hmm. we do. Um, 
Oof. We'll pause here. Take uh, a water break. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like it's such a tricky it's such a tricky thing to put a finger on. Yeah. Um, that's what I was like, fuck. It's such a tricky thing to put a finger on, but like that's where I feel this is where I feel a lot of people get stuck. Like they're producing content, you know, they're doing their thing, but it's not yet turned into like a full fledged life style or business like for them it's still kind of a hobby and you know what is it about what we're doing that separates our execution from other folks's and that's what i was really kind of trying to dive into but it's nebulous man like i i i don't know um i don't know like is what we're doing that different maybe um or are we just is it that we've just been con- like executing consistently? I don't know. I think it's so. I want to jump in there. I think it's t- there's two main things. One is execution, executing consistently on a very high level, that you win probably eighty percent of the battles. That's mm-hmm. number one. Number two, creating content that evokes some type of emotion or some type of action. I think that I think that's the second part. So if you can continually create content for a very long extended time at a high level and that content resonates and provokes people to do an action, that's how you build some type of audience, some type of tribe. Mm. And it doesn't have to be 100,000 followers. It can be a thousand true fans. And if you have a thousand true fans pay you $100 for whatever product, service or company you have. Then you have a six-figure business. Mm. So for me, I think that brings everything down to can you consistently be a practitioner? And then is your content valuable enough? And is your marketing, your strategy smart enough to reach the right people? Right. To have those true fans who will buy potential things from you, who will share your content by word of mouth, mm. and who will be your evangelist. Mm. You have to have some type of evangelist. Your mom, your family, yeah. your friends that you grew up with, someone has to be your first evangelist. And when they share that, they have to have some type of social capital come towards them or feel like they're going to get some social capital from sharing your content. Yeah, some things are coming to mind right now. Mm-hmm. Um, between... I think if I would have given the same talk a few years ago to versus now, mm-hmm. the same exact talk, let's say, I'd be able to charge more now and potentially none before. Mm-hmm. And I think that my um, ability to earn has really come from a higher level of understanding mm. about how things work. That's what I is coming to me right now. For instance. And it makes you move different. It makes me move different. It makes us take different moves. It makes us spend our time differently. Mm-hmm. Um, for instance, I now know the speaking landscape a little bit better. I know mm-hmm. that there's universities that have student you know, run organizations that With have budget. budgets mm-hmm. that look for people to come and speak on specific things. I know that um, you can get a literary agent mm-hmm. some. It, i.e. that is someone who um, you know cuts book deals for a living they sign you and th- it costs you nothing to get a literary agent and then you can uh, put together a book proposal yep um, and you shop that around and if you're fortunate enough to get a book deal you get a cash advance mm-hmm. right and if you get the cash advance and you have the promise of a book deal all of a sudden that makes you more attractive on the speaking circuit yeah it's and all true. of a sudden that makes you more attractive if you put the work in to grow your social media presence as we've been doing. Yes. Then it's like all these things feed each other. And I mm-hmm. think that my understanding of how things work is what is getting me to earn more and more. Um, and, and like you mm-hmm. said, it's making, it's making me move different. It's, a, it's changing my approach to how I spend my time. Mm-hmm. and how I evaluate potential moves. And how you visualize. And that goes back, to, I think I said this on the first episode, your life is a physical representation of what's going on in here. Right. And so if what's going on in here changes, then what's going on out in the world changes. Right. And going even further, um, I, I believe Jim Rohn had, had, had such a quote. I'm trying to remember the quote now. I literally just had it. Um we'll have to come back to it okay i I had a really good quote by jim jim rome but it's okay well so who's someone that you haven't had the chance to work with that you would love to work with whether it's like big name or Mm -hmm. or a peer 
So I'm gonna put this out here, man. I am from Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. Or well, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. I went to school at Ohio State in Columbus. Okay. Nationwide Insurance mm. is headquartered in Columbus, Ohio. Mm. Nationwide Insurance is the number one title sponsor for Black Enterprises Entrepreneur Summit. Wow. Nationwide Insurance is creating commercials for folks of color and women all over the country. I would love to work with them and to put out uh, some amazing content, be a brand ambassador. Okay. Uh, I think I could rival Chris Paul and, <laughs> and Steph Curry and team who are all on the State Farm team. I think we can create something that's really cool up around entrepreneurs. I love it. You're, you're putting, this is a time stamp moment. I'm right putting this out there. Nationwide Insurance was up <laughs> the kid i am from the this is like the it, it, it makes so much sense it's so organic it's so authentic right and uh i would love for nationwide to hit me up T tell me tell me about a brand that you would love to work with admire yeah well uh, the the brands that come to mind like i would love the chance to work with uh nas and hove oh you're, you're it, you know like that wasn't fair <laughs> i take it totally different you said brands nas and hove yes are a brand you know i just i just i i feel like <laughs> what we do there's so many parallels to like the hip-hop the way hip-hop has evolved mm -hmm. and i really have loved seeing how you know rappers that came around the 90s the ones that have stuck around and stood the test of time yep have developed a business since and mm -hmm. are now in venture capital they're invested in media they're invested in you know restaurant chains yep. um, they're invested in a bunch of different things and i think there's so many parallels between what we do and what they do i want to jump in there yeah jump in. i want to jump in there man so people so for me i always say that wall street paper was my first win i talked about the tool belt so wall mm -hmm. street paper is like a wrench there's a screwdriver there's a drill there's all these things that i use wall yep. street paper is just one tool in my tool belt okay and that tool is a gateway drug to do other things. Okay. Podcasting, commercials, larger brand deals, print, what have you, right? I feel like that's the same thing with rap. Mm. Very smart rappers, that is their gateway drug into business. Mm. That is their first win. And it's almost even like sports. All rappers want to be ball players, all ball players want to be rappers. Right. Drake. Right. And so for sports players, they make so much more money outside of their actual job. Wow. I believe that's very similar to top tier rappers. Make so much more money outside of actual music. Right. So I just think that there are so many similarities. I wanted to put that out there. Yeah, that and folks are, you got to just gamify things mm -hmm. and you got to have transferable mindsets to be able to uh, grasp things and connect the dots. Yeah. Because if you like, even if you don't know everything about ballers, you don't know everything about social media and what have you, but you know about Nas, you know about Jay, and right. you see where they came from and how they transcended right. different industries. And that gets me to think, like for anyone listening, what's what's your skill set? Like, what's that one initial mm -hmm. tool that's going to get you, yeah, you know, in the ring, and then let you build from there? Yeah. In and dive deep on that tool. Get in the trenches. Know everything about that tool. And anytime your name comes up in a conversation, people should name you by that tool. Right. Like that is Brandon's skill set. He is the best at X, Y, and Z. If mm -hmm. that is not what you're doing, it's going to be very hard for you to become an entrepreneur, start your own business, or even like get poached mm. to go to a new company mm. or switch companies. Yeah, I would even say if you're not coming if you're not top five mm -hmm. for whatever it is that you do, mm -hmm. you're not doing it distinctly enough. Right. Especially in your, like, city? Yeah. Like, like if you're not top five, when someone thinks of what you do, you're not doing, you don't mm -hmm. have a fresh enough perspective. For instance, mm -hmm. I'd be damned mm -hmm. if we're not top five whenever someone says Harlem Entrepreneur. I know. I fucking dare you to Google it. <laughs> Just Google it. Harlem Entrepreneur. Google Harlem Entrepreneur and tell me if we're not top five. It's true. You know what I'm saying? And that's because we carved a distinct lane. Mm -hmm. And for me, brand, picture uh, picture a, a penny jar. Anytime someone says your name, it's a it's a penny in the penny jar. Yep. You know? And so over time, the more people say your name. Builds up, man. You get brand equity. And, and guys, that's where it comes into uh, compound interest, I would call it. And uh Warren Buffett says compound interest is like the eighth wonder of the world. <laughs> and so if you can get that compound interest, which means that you are continually 
being a practitioner and you're continually just killing it Mm -hmm. and you're continually creating something that gives value that evokes an emotion like it's a wrap it's going to happen it's not about if it's about when and you just need to continue to buckle up and then eventually build your team build your team of avengers use other people's superpowers and like handle business go go kill the game go fight all the top enemies and the top teams and perform i mean the reason we look the reason the show looks as good as it does is not because of you and I. No. It's because of, you know, Andy and Jeffrey. Yeah. Amazing um, team. We, exactly. We've surrounded ourselves. Um, so, damn, I think that was a good riff. That was like, such a good riff, it's man. A good That riff. was such a good riff. Um, okay. Um, so, let's talk about investing a little bit. Yes. Um, finally. Finally. Episode we, three. We haven't uh, done done much of that uh, on the show yet. Mm-hmm. Um, but let's let's talk let's talk about it. Let's talk about the type of investments we make, mm-hmm. um, the type of investments we want to make in the future, the type of investments we've been most excited about. Um, so why don't you kick it off? Um, how is it that you look at inv- and don't give me the general? We look for founder, but like let's talk about. That's what I look for though. But um, <laughs> fair, fair. Uh, no, I wanted to jump in, in Harlem Capital, make sure everyone knows about it. Uh, some people continually still ask me about Harlem Capital and investing, and yes, yes, yes. So Harlem Capital, early stage venture capital fund, focus on people of color and women who start amazing companies that are growing exponentially. And uh, we are looking to invest in 1,000 diverse entrepreneurs over the next 20 years. Right. So we're super excited yes. Yes, to are. change the face of entrepreneurship. Boom. In terms of companies or people that I look for, like I like to invest in the founder. I want to believe that the founder is the right person with the right solution at the right time. Right. And so I like to dig into things like traction. So traction means users. It means also revenue that they're producing. Um, I also like to somehow have some, not relation, but just like have some type of um, understanding of the product. Right. Uh, So AI, VR, and things of that nature are not necessarily super um, great for me because I don't understand them that well, but it tends to be marketing, it tends to be media, it tends to be tech-enabled services and products that I, i'm super interested in wow congratulations you just gave me the most cookie cutter fucking answer on vc ever it's like what every vc says all the time hmm. but well i don't know i don't listen to a lot of vcs but uh um, <laughs> so but but i so i want to zoom it in right because i mm-hmm. know that there are going to be people listening that that feel like hey i'm a good founder i feel like i'm tackling a good problem at the right time cool um and i have some traction yet i can't get any investors well, Harlem Capital doesn't invest in a company unless they have traction. So, so I'm just giving it true to them, you know? So. Right. Yeah, that, and that's fair. And, you know, but I feel like you and I are, you know, some of the youngest VCs in the game. Yes. And we produce content. And not a lot of VCs produce content, if any at all. Like, I mean, there's a few that put some posts on Instagram and might tweet. But as far as, like, doing this, I mean, mm-hmm. there's a 20-minute VC, which is an excellent podcast. I highly Pretty recommend strong. it. Um but other than that, like because we're two young VCs of color, I feel like we have a responsibility to just get even more real with our people. Um, I'm, a, so, I'm gonna let you go first, then. Well, uh, so firstly, when it comes to investing, you know, we're so I'll break it down like this: if anyone that is interested in investing, you probably um, should not get started with venture capital because in, unless you are prepared mm-hmm. to invest in companies, um, over the course of the long run and take, you know, a big position in venture, um, mm-hmm. it's not the correct vehicle because venture mm-hmm. is so susceptible, you know, it's, you're highly likely to fail in venture, right? And so the numbers work against you until they work for you. Right. So un- unless you're committed to invest in venture consistently over time, mm-hmm. I would not recommend it. I would recommend if you want to dabble, you can put your money into a fund like mm-hmm. ours or like any fund and say, hey, I love this asset class. I don't have the time to or constantly the or the expertise yeah. to constantly be in the weeds and look for great founders. So put my money to work. Got it. So I'll start with that. Um, in terms of like cash flowing investments, my mm-hmm. favorite type of cash flowing investment is real estate. Got it. Because Month in, month out, I get my rent checks. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. that's a totally different style of investing. Mm-hmm. Real estate is not that dynamic. You know, I'm not going to, you know, my money's not going to 10x over the course of, you know, a few years. 
um, real estate is not. Um, I find it very interesting, but you know, it's one industry. It's it's kind of um, you know, it's a predictable, very linear type of investment vehicle mm-hmm. that has plenty of advantages because. Um, you know, we can talk in an episode in more depth about this, but there's say, yeah. there's uh, tax benefits. You know, you can you park your cash, you get cash flow, your money grows mm-hmm. over time. It's physical, which means that the bank can loan you or give you revolving lines of credit based on the asset. Yeah. You know, so these are all things that I've learned the hard way over time. Mm-hmm. As many of you guys know, watching, you know, I did not go to business school. I'm a college dropout, very proudly. So I've learned a lot of this stuff on my own. Um, but just wanted to distinguish, you know, something stable okay. like real estate, something dynamic like venture, and then lastly, um, we also invest in small businesses. Yep. This is totally separate from Harlem Capital. Mm-hmm. We've invested in, you know, Harlem Coffee, which is a coffee shop. We've invested in a dental practice, mm-hmm. um, and these are types of investments that cash flow gradually over mm-hmm. time. Now, honing in on venture, because I think this is what a lot of our audience finds very interesting. Yeah, it's venture a hot topic. Capital. This is a type of company that by design is looking to tackle a very large market shift right now. Mm-hmm. They're not looking to be five, $10 million companies, which by the way, it's nothing, totally fine. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. In fact, Cash I wish I had $10 great. million right now. I don't. <laughs> right? For the record, I don't have $10 million. But these are Soon. companies that by design are looking to tackle a billion dollar or multi hundred million dollar market opportunity. And they're looking to, you know, go from scratch to this big player. Mm -hmm. And by the way, oh, by the way, when you go after such a large market opportunity, you are way more likely to fail than someone who's going after a $5 million opportunity. Just by design. True. The numbers are stacked against you. That means if you're going after a big market, you're going against big fish. Mm-hmm. That means you're going against smarter people with more money. Like we can talk on and on about all the reasons why it won't work. But as I talk about all the time, you have to find the one reason why it will work, stick mm. to it, and you set out to build this company. Now, that is venture capital. You and I look for people that are looking to tackle very big problems. And if I, I'm going to kick this off to you, it sounded like you were saying that you like to invest in things that you inherently understand very well mm-hmm. and also feel like you can add a lot of value to. Correct. So that means it almost sounds like investing or you know fundraising is a lot like dating. Like there's it a is. lot of perfectly great people that are just aren't matches for each other. Exactly. And that's why Harlem Capital exists because fund managers by just like historical references have always invested in people who look like them or mm-hmm. people that they were comfortable with. Mm. And fund managers were not people of color and women. Mm. And that's why we started. And so it, it kind of does make sense why um, folks put their money into into things that they're comfortable with. Right, right. So. And people that we're comfortable with. You know, uh, for instance, um, Henri slash Jared, you, um, you guys all have uh, kind of a backing um, background and mm-hmm. I've noticed you guys feel inherently more comfortable with someone who's gone through B school. Yep, B school, banking, and, finance, and whatever. knows how to talk the talk and blah blah blah. Whereas I look for, found, I mm-hmm. inherently connect with someone who's a little scrappier and has mm-hmm. more a lot of tenacity and has had to overcome mm-hmm. not having those credentials with just sheer grit. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I really like that our firm has that. I was balance. about to say. You need that on a team, and you mm-hmm. don't need a, a bunch of people who are just like you. You need people who are different. And so going even further, we're looking for founders who can attract those different players, those, those exactly. utility players. Exactly. And, and if you can show that you can build a good team, you can show that you can get traction and start creating revenue, and you show that, hey, like we just need this X amount of money so that we, because we're bursting at the seams right now, so that we can scale and take on that opportunity. Exactly. And let, let's, let's dive in on that. You know what does not get you any money? fucking making excuses true like Mm -hmm. i would if only i had money i would do x Mm. like that will never ever get you any funding right what we look for is someone who says hey i don't have any resources and still Mm -hmm. i've been able to through sheer grit Mm -hmm. energy compassion and whatever have been able to convince players to join my team and get it done anyway even if it's on a small scale Mm -hmm. we don't care about 
you know, necessarily um, how your team is performing now per se, because we're early stage. Mm -hmm. We know it's going to be imperfect. We know it's not going to be, you know, uh, as pristine as it can be. Mm -hmm. We're looking for the basic ingredients that tells us, hmm, if we add, if we put you in the pressure cooker, if we put you in the pressure cooker, (laughs) you're going to make the perfect fucking beans. Yeah. (laughs) Dominican. (laughs) Uh, but even going going forward, I, I want to also t- talk to people about fundraising in general. First of all, when you're fundraising, like you are fundraising because you are trying to capture the market and you're fundraising for about 18, maybe 24 months. And wow. then you're going to have to fundraise again. Right. And so you have to be very clear cut and precise about exactly what this fundraising money that you're taking is going to do for your company. Who are you going to hire? What type of products are you going to build? Is it going towards marketing? Is it this, that, or another? Let, let's let's hone in here, um, and I don't want to rant too long because I want to keep the podcast decent length, but yes. with fundraising, we have come across founders mm-hmm. that have solid businesses, mm-hmm. potentially venture scale, but have not cracked the code of fundraising. Yep. And as a result, we did not invest and let me just clarify right now we're investing small dollars because we're investing our own cash Mm -hmm. when we raise our fund we're going to be taking we're going to have the ability to lead the investment Mm -hmm. i.e that means we can put up a big chunk of the round Mm -hmm. and we can take someone that we believe in and maybe hasn't cracked venture and we can say hey we can tell other investors rally around this entrepreneur Mm -hmm. we know we believe in them Right now, because we write smaller checks, by default, we have to defer to mm. um, f- uh, coming in at, at the later end of the round yep. when that entrepreneur has already proved that they have cracked the code of venture. To a larger player who's leading. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Now, I just want to hone in around a specific area, and that is a lot of fundraising has to do with soft skills. Mm. It's intangible. It's brand. I, we come it's across really brand. this all the time where someone's like, well, I got all the boxes checked. Why aren't investors investing in my mm-hmm. business? And you and I know oftentimes it has to do with the soft intangibles. What are those intangibles in your eyes? Man, this is such a good question. I mean, is your personal brand, right? Like, so for me, I, I like, can you articulate your vision strong enough, mm-hmm. right? Can you talk about your teammates and what they do and how you're going to leverage them later on. Exactly. Uh, can you talk about why your product is so sticky? Mm-hmm. Why people would be devastated if they no longer had it? Mm. And then what is the vision of that product? Like, mm. how is it going to change? What are the different revenue streams? What are some of the things that's also going to solve down the line? If you can paint that confidence and you can like reek of it, mm-hmm. that's the type of person that you're looking to invest in because None of it's proven out yet. So exactly. all we have, all we have is your word, the, the, the very small case study that you have produced and your team. Mm. And we're going to talk to every single person on that team. We're going to look at your financials. We're going to try out the product and we're going to poke tons of holes in it. And, and for us right now, we'll talk to other investors. Right. And we'll see why they passed on a deal or why they are invested in That's a deal. That's a true story. Right. <laughs> and so you have to remember that every... you. Every single time, every single shot you take has to be the best shot, the best swing at the bat. Right. And and just to button that up, mm-hmm. um, there has n- not been a single investment that we've made that has been, quote unquote, a perfect scenario. Mm-hmm. At some point, whether it's your traction, your sales process, what, whatever aspect of the business, at some point, you're going to have strengths in one area, in some areas, and you know weaknesses in others. Yep. And at some point, that doubt has to be chalked up to faith in the founder, yeah. mm-hmm. in the founder. And a lot of mm-hmm. what you talked about, whether it was you know communicating the vision to the team, all this other stuff, a lot of what you talked about came down to the founder. The founder. That's all you're investing in. Mm-hmm. Oh, man, is, is the founder's ability to, to execute. So. You know, I, I think this is a. It was a good riff session. And it was a good it's, riff. I do want to. I do. I would like to end it with one more thing. You yep. have to remember, like we've seen almost four hundred companies. We've invested in six startups, right. right? And that's like a a good investment rate. So I think founders, if you can do one thing for yourself, understand that about uh, investors investing about two percent of the businesses that they see. Right. So it's a ninety eight percent chance. Right. That they will say no to you as soon as you meet somebody. Right. So understand all those no's are coming, but you have to be vice versa as a founder too and understand you should be only saying yes 
to a very handful of right. investors as well. Right. And if, if uh, fundraising is like dating, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, you don't date everybody. You don't date everybody, <laughs> A. And B, if you know that the investment odds are low, do your homework and find investors that you know are, are prone to mm-hmm. investing in your area, to investing. And by, oh, by the way, black women, Latina women, Latino founders, minority founders, mm-hmm. there are a lot of kind of diverse funds sprouting up. You know, Harlan, quite a, Ka- Harlan Capital quite is one. A few. You know, Backstage is another one. Um, you know, Precursor. A, a precursor. We have a lot of corporate venture, like Comcast Ventures and what mm-hmm. have you. There's a lot of players and opportunities sprouting up right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and you'll hear the media talk a lot about, you know, very little funding dollars going to black and Latinos. That's true. That's why we exist. Although it's certainly better than it ever has been and will only continue to get better. Mm-hmm. Pipeline Angels invest in women. Yes. Um, you know, Female so- founders fund, like... And I would say keep us in the loop. Mm-hmm. Our the latest investment that we just invested in, they came to us last year. Yeah, I believe it was March two thousand and seventeen. We took a pass, and we took a pass. Or and they also told us, "Hey, we're we're not necessarily raising right now, but we just wanted to let y'all know." Right. They we put them in deals to watch category, mm-hmm. and we did. We watched you know the deal mature over time, and over time. Um, you either i wrote this in the article but Mm. you come across a team and when you come across a team they either build or diminish Mm. your confidence time tells everything too and so every interaction you have if you're building confidence over time you start to see that founder as someone who can execute the vision i think um that's a great place to wrap up let's do a question of the episode Mm -hmm. um uh what 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 question do you have for the audience what question do i have for the audience ah man you know, if you could go one place this year and learn something, hmm. where would you go to learn? Or where would you go and what would you learn? Right. Okay. I like that. Um, uh, that's great. Where would you go and what would you learn? I Yeah, would and the go focus is to learn. To learn. Mm-hmm. I would go to, uh, I would go to Italy mm-hmm. to learn about beauty. Wow. What kind of beauty? beauty i feel like italians have a sense of swagger and everything yeah beauty in mm-hmm. the way that they walk talk the way that they design things mm-hmm. the architecture you know the way that they play with light and architecture i want to capture that beauty mm. in a bottle <laughs> and uh, bring it to everything that i do what about you before we close wow man it will be it's a tie between japan and london mm. both i would go for fashion for london i would go to savile row Mm. And I will do my best to learn how to become a cut. They call them cutters. And those are the folks who actually cut the suit and, and put all the fabrics together mm. and create the canvas for the chest and dope. everything. Dope. That would be dope. And if I was in Japan, I would just want to dive deeper into their culture. They actually are, have been known to do American better than Americans. <laughs> um, and a lot of all the buyers. So I'm a little offshoot, but buyers create trends buyers of barney's uh, bergdorf mm. whatever they create trends because after they create the trends everyone starts buying them mm. and a lot of buyers do a lot of traveling to japan mm. and they bring those back to the u.s that's good to know and so i would love to dive into one of those two uh, countries and cities around there cool so there it is guys chop it up episode three we hope you guys have dug it um let mm-hmm. us know in the comments below where would you go and what would you learn peace peace